348. 348. Jesus is all the world to me. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 2, and 4 of the song. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he is my friend. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's leading day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that Six hundred and sixty-three. Six six three. There is sunshine in my soul. Again, we'll sing verses one, two, and four of this song. So today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments grow. Father in heaven, we all bow before you this evening. So thankful for this time that we have to come together as a group of your children.
to enjoy this day of worship. We know that these days are edifying to us and and that we need this time to focus on you and to focus our minds away from all the worldly cares. We pray for those that are not with us today, for those that are sick or ailing, that you'll be with them. Those that are traveling, you'll also be with them and bless them in their travels. Be with the, the teacher tonight and help him to have a ready recollection of what he's studied so he can lead us in our minds and edify us all. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're good? Sounds all right. Welcome to our class, uh, second class of this series, uh, God's Word, Our Treasure. We talked about uh, last week, kind of in an introductory form, how important God's Word is, how it should be our treasure. We should treasure this Word that God has given us. And you can imagine what this world would be like, our environment, probably a lot like what it is today, but without God, is my point. (laughs) Without God at all. If he didn't, if he created everything that is, it's just like he created now. And, but he didn't reveal himself to us. Can you imagine what life would be? Uh, it would be maybe perhaps more like in Noah's day when everything, every man's heart was evil. Um, but today there's a lot of that. Uh, the, the world, everyone is, seems to be the natural order of things is very selfish-minded. Everything is for, for me. I'm out for what's mine, you know, that kind of thing. Um, So we are truly blessed that God has revealed himself. It's such a wonderful thing. And if you have a uh, lesson sheet with you, if you don't, there should be a few on the the desk in the the lobby. But uh, how would you describe the word of God as a treasure? Why, why, why do you think, why should we think of it as a treasure? I brought this up so, uh, as a title. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Pearl of great price. Okay, pearl of great price. Um, how much would you give for that treasure? Everything, right, David? So if God's word is our treasure then we should, it should be to us worth anything that we have to give, right? Anything that God requires of us, it should be worth it for us to have that revelation that God has given. So, in the, in the lesson sheet, I, I posed the question, uh, what value do you see in having access to what God has declared It's more of a rhetorical question, but I'd like for us all to think about that. 
And then I posed the, the comment, and an internal question could be this, is it my treasure? Is God's word really a treasure? Is that the way I look at it? Is I, do I think of it as a treasure, and do I constantly want it by my side? Do I constantly want to watch over it? Like something that, a, a pearl of great, great uh, treasure. Is it that value to us? It is a physical life that we live in, but this, this is not, this, this is a physical treasure, but it, what it represents is much, much greater than any physical treasure. Did I see a hand coming up? That's a good point. Some people in the world are actually not permitted to have a Bible and to have access to God's Word. So, uh, even more reason for us to consider how well we are blessed with the revelation from God. If we share the treasure, then it will grow and be multiplied in the world. Yes, David says, if we share it, it will grow. That treasure will grow. And, and I want to get into that a little more as we go, too. The treasure God is offering us is one we cannot see with our eyes. It's one we cannot touch with our hands. How can it be the most precious, precious of treasures throughout the universe? And it truly is the most precious, I can't say that, precious treasure God's revelation is critical. Let's see what comes up here. <coughs> Seem to have a problem with the <laughs> device. <laughs> Thank you. I want to uh, go to Luke 24 and verse 13, starting through 27. Now behold, this story is one about after, right after Jesus' crucifixion. How do I get rid of that? Outside the box? Up there? No. Okay. Not sure I can read it. It's a lot smaller now. I'll do it this the old fashioned way. Luke twenty four and verse twenty four starting. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. 
but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I think I started in the wrong place. I'm going to start in 17. No, you're right, 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a wonderful experience and what what we would never know anything about this if God had not revealed this for us. If he had not provided this word so that we'd know, we could know about this story about Jesus and these incidents that happened to all the people that were there, the ones that actually saw what happened. They saw the crucifixion. They saw him die, and they saw that he was buried. The things that come within the scriptures, look at the creation and all of the events that happened in history in the early Uh, parts of the Old Testament how would we know any of those things man cannot discover these things in and of himself God had to reveal these things to us and so we are very blessed to have this word if I can get this computer to work well it looks better up there Um, I'm going to Go on to Second Peter and spend some time in Second Peter talking about that which is revealed. Well, before I do that, it looks like I've got something else to do here. It's a good thing I got this, but I can't hardly see it. God's word is provided to us to accomplish a purpose. So God created this universe, this vast universe, this wonderful, beautiful universe that we live in, and the earth that is so perfect for us to live in. Yes, even in Bakersfield. Uh, We can always go to Fismo, right? But he created all this, and then 
He said all that was good. But then when he created man and woman, he said this is very good. This, this is what God thought when, to himself when he created man and woman. And so the creation of God is beyond any imagination of man. And here we are on the earth, but we have God's word. Peter, an inspired writer, let's begin in the first verse of uh, 2 Peter. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm out of order here because I can't see my notes. Isaiah 55, let's read from that. Isaiah, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So God's word is not just for our perusal. It, is, it has a purpose. And God, in his wisdom, his infinite wisdom, he has prepared the completion of this word that we have today. And he has revealed it to us. God's revelation to mankind will go forth, as it says in Isaiah. It will be made available to those of us who are seeking to find the truth, the wisdom of God, the meaning of life, our purpose set forth by God, the Creator. It will prosper those who genuinely want to know the wisdom of God. To those who do not know God, it can be an answer to the question, is there a God? Is there more to, to this life than just what we see? God's revelation is complete. We have in this book, the Bible, all God has provided as far as his revelation. There is no continuing revelation beyond what we have in the Bible we now have in our hands. Those would be the ideas of men not right, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 states, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes, God has revealed this truth to us, but we have a responsibility, and that is a very special responsibility. As you have seen, as I have seen, many take this word and pervert it to make it mean something different, totally. Something different than what God intended. One of the points I made last week was that our faith is based upon this word. That faith can only be what God wants it to be, and it can only be effectual in our lives as our faith, as the faith, if it is strictly according to God's word. So we have a responsibility to interpret that word. And that word will interpret itself. But we have to be patient and we have to be studious. And we have to take that word and study it in such a way that we will understand what God has provided for us, what he has revealed, the truth that truth that Randy was talking about this morning. It's not the truth if we pervert that word, if we take it and interpret it in different ways and we make it say something different, then it's no longer the truth. So we have a responsibility that goes with this blessing. It is not meant to satisfy our curiosity and then, and then be set aside. We can spend our whole life looking into the wisdom of God within his word and never reach the culmination of what we can learn and benefit from in becoming all things that pertain to life and godliness. By using God's word correctly, we can continue to grow and develop 
as spiritual beings in God's kingdom. We can fulfill God's purpose. In doing so completely by the authority within this word, we will show our love for God. We will honor Him and please Him because we have bowed to His authority. We have showed reverence for Him and this word and showed how important it is to us by showing that care and our love for God. God's purpose is simple. First John 5, 1 through 3 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. God's word is straightforward and simple. To those who seek him so those who seek God will find God Larry Yes, I, I agree with you. Let me answer your, 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 uh, your statement because I agree. Um, probably this was not written very well. Uh, when I said that it is simple, it uses simple language. It uses the common language. And so in that respect, that it, it is common language that a, a common man can understand. And you're right because Peter says that Paul says some things that are hard to understand. So, and, and it is, and, and Larry brings this up, it's a good point, that the Bible is not a book that everybody can just pick up and start at the beginning and read and get a lot out of it. Because, not because it's unreadable, but because it's not an ordinary, um, it's not an ordinary type of, of reading. You have to be seeking God. You, you need to want to know who God is. And you have to look at the scriptures as a book that is set up in two testaments. And so there's some things that, that I think you're alluding to, Larry, that a person needs to understand. But there's help for everyone. And, then, and, and that comes, falls back on us, doesn't it, Larry?
Okay, good, good point. Speaking of Ecclesiastes, the next verse is in uh, Ecclesiastes 1. It says, I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is grasping for the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So in all of the splendor that Solomon lived in, in all of the knowledge, the wisdom that he had, he doesn't sound like a very happy person. Um, But he had everything at his fingertips. He was wealthy, he had wisdom, uh, power, and it just doesn't seem to have satisfied him very much as a person. Okay, let's move on to Second Peter and verse uh, chapter one, and read uh, verses one through four. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, in uh, question number two on our, sh- our worksheet here, it says, Would grace and peace be possible without the knowledge of God and His Word? You might be able to think that you find peace. Maybe you find peace in, in your world around you, in your endeavors or your hobbies or whatever. But I don't think that's the peace that God is talking about. And grace, certainly, both of these, grace and peace, come from God and are only possible from God. And so, would grace and peace would be possible without the knowledge of God and His Word? And I would, I would have to say, certainly not. In what measure is grace and peace provided? In the uh, New American Standard Version, it says in 1 Peter, the first chapter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So grace and peace is supplied in what measure? Multiplied. In uh, 2 Peter, it says multiplied. And in uh, 1 Peter, it says... um, um, fullest, in the fullest measure... This is an eye test up here. (laughs) This is about this big. Uh, So yeah, to the fullest measure. So let's look at the uh, verse 2. No, verse 3. And the question says, question 3, it says, look up the word divine and explore its meaning. Um, Did anybody do that? You come up with a definition for divine? Go ahead. Uh, I have like God, spiritual, godly, and then it's mercifully and uh, undefiled. Undefiled? 
okay? That's, that's more, um, but that, that helps, I think. Uh, I got uh, of, from, or like God. So divine is a very particular word that applies to God uh, in his majesty, in his place in the heavens, in his power, in his might, all that God, uh, anything that God requires it is, is at his disposal that defines God as all-powerful, all-knowing, in everywhere. Uh, in Acts 17, twenty nine, thirty, and 31, Paul uh, talks about the divine nature. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which we will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In Romans 1 and 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood, though, through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Paul wrote to the Romans in that regard. Um, You can see something divine in the creation, can't you? Without knowing God. You can know that this is a marvelous world and there is order to it. You can see beauty. Uh, you can see how the weather changes the seasons and they're always in order. You, know, you can notice a lot of these things. And without knowing God through his word, you can have an idea, perhaps, that there, there's somebody or something that has caused all of this. But you don't really know about God and your own purpose in all of this world that God has created. So it, it doesn't really help much to, to see it but we'll, we'll look a little more at, at Romans uh, here briefly, more about that particular thing, the people of Rome and how they disregarded God and how they didn't recognize him uh, purposely. Question number four says, is there anything lacking in what God has provided through his divine power? What's it say there in verse 3? Do I need to go back? In verse 3, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So, it would seem, by what Peter says there, that we are lacking nothing. We have everything that we need. To fulfill the purpose that God has given us. Question number five says, God has freed us from the corruption, uh, parentheses, sin, that is in the world. Compare with Romans 1, 20 through 25. get back there there it is for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead 
so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. So have conditions in our world changed today? No, I would, I would say not. Go ahead, Gary. Good, good point. So yeah, I would say that it's not changed much. And just, it just goes to show you that man doesn't change that much. I know there's, there's talk of evolution of man, and, and technology shows a lot of evolution. Uh, the way we live is certainly different than in Jesus' day. Um, but the heart of man, that part that, that abides forever, the, the soul, the soul of man has not changed. The, the things that John pointed out that were worldly, that were sinful, the things of the world, that hasn't changed. Man sins, and that continues to be the same problem. From generation to generation, for thousands of years, it hasn't changed. But God's Word has not. And what God provides is all we need. And it is just as effective today as it was in the beginning. Number six says, list these things described in verses five through seven. How do we add these things to our faith? Well, we haven't read that yet. So, Second Peter. Well, Second Peter one four states, "We may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world." Noah escaped the corruption of the world in his day. Remember that. In the days of Noah, God was sorry that he created man. And he decided that he was going to destroy man. But Noah, of all mankind, was the one man that pleased God. So God blessed Noah and his family and told Noah to build the ark. And we know the story how God flooded the earth and killed every person, everything, every living thing, and in fact changed the face of the earth. And that's how much God thought of the people that were evil continually, and that's how much God thought of Noah, that he saved him because he walked with God. He loved God. And he showed it in his life and in his preaching. It says in Peter that he was a preacher. So, Noah lived in probably the worst corruption, if there is such a thing, um, of any generation. And God saved him. Gen Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in 2 Peter 2, 5, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah and his family and the animals on the ark were the only survivors of the flood. So 
So what should be the result of our being partakers of the divine nature? 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we look into the Word of God and we become like Christ. If we develop, if we, if we strive to be what God wants us to be. We don't see Christ in the mirror, so to speak, but we can become the image of Christ. We can be like Him. In Romans 12 and verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So this transformation comes through God's Word. And we all know from uh, Carrie's study of Romans in the 12th chapter, that is what God's Word can do for us. It can transform us into the image of Christ. We can become what God intended for us to be. But it's only because God has revealed this word to us with that intent. The will of God has always been the ob objective of those who love God and seek to please Him. 2 Peter 1 and verses 5, 6, and 7 states, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Perseverance could be also stated as patience. They're very similar words. So how easy are these things for us to develop? Larry? Right, I, I, that is a good visual that you, that I got from your tree thing there. That's don't don't light a match though, right? But yeah, but that's that's good because if and and faith is based on faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So our faith, as I said earlier, is based on the true word of God the truly interpreted Word of God in the way that God intended for us to understand it. And then as Larry so elo eloquently uh, gave us that picture of a Christmas tree, then we can add these things to it. So that's probably why I asked that question. How easy is it to develop these things? Because they're not very easy. But when you have a faith that has built over time in God's Word. And your desire is to please God and to become the image of Christ. 
and you want so badly to do that, you're willing to sacrifice anything. You will give up anything, your enjoyment in this or that, your time, uh, your efforts in whatever that you, you spend time in. Uh, you would give up anything that you could to add these things to your faith, to become those things, uh, to have knowledge and self-control. How hard is self-control? We know how difficult that can be. Things pop into our heads all the time, but God's Word is the perfect weapon to drive those things away. Perseverance or patience. How hard is it to have patience? None of these things are easy. Brotherly kindness, godliness, and brotherly kindness, it's and love. Loving your enemies. How hard can that be? But, God says these things because He wants us to desire Him through our faith and become these things. It's not, it's not to be um, a burden to us. It is something to, we love to want to strive for in order to please Him. So I asked, uh, do these things become part of our transformation? And yes, I believe that is part of the transformation. And in Romans uh, 12, it says, the renewing of your mind. Well, our mind is renewed by God's Word. That's what, that's what fills our head. That's what, uh, and Rick talked about this in, in his attitudes class. I mean, it's, how could we coordinate those things any better, Rick? I mean, they just, they, they fit so well together that God can change us through our minds absorbing God's Word. Devotion to it, that treasure from God is what brings forth that transformation. Okay, in 2 Peter 1 and verses 8 and 9, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he, had, he was cleansed from his old sins. So, if you forget that you, you have a sinful nature, if you forget that God forgave you of your sins and washed you clean, if you forget those things, it is being kind of blind, isn't it? Because if we are being what God wants us to be, we are delving into this word all the time. We are using it to remind us, as Peter says here in a few verses, reminding us over and over again what is important, what is truth, what can we fill our minds with to drive away the, the bad thoughts that try to creep into our mind? Um, knowledge does not guarantee you will be pleasing to God. And we've already spoken to that. Second Peter 1 and verse 10 and 11, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, it sounds like I've run out of time. We will put a peg there and we'll pick it up again next week. Thanks for your attention and your comments.